Hi, this is Craig Stocks here for Utah Desert Remote Observatories. You can find us online at utahdesertremote.com and we would love to talk to you about either hosting your telescope under our dark sky or an hourly rental on one of our systems. I had some questions about an image I posted of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, so I thought I would just walk through the, the entire process kind of from start to finish. Uh, so this was obviously imaged from the uh, remote observatory uh, with, in fact, with this system, which is the uh, plane wave CDK 12.5. And the scope that you see on top is a William Optic Zenith Star 81 that I use as a guide scope. Uh, probably not ideal as opposed to using an off-axis guider, but uh, that's the direction I've been going and trying to make that work. I do all of my imaging, like I said, remotely, and I control everything with Voyager. And just to walk through quickly how that works, I connect from my home computer, which is where I am now, to the uh, remote observatory using the Google Remote Desktop. And so right now I've got Google Remote Desktop on the screen, and we're connected to the remote computer at the observatory and this is the main Voyager screen and from here I typically use this web dashboard beta uh, it's pretty well developed I'm not sure why they still call it a beta but one of the nice features about it is it lets you define a virtual field of view on the uh, uh, kind of a planetarium view so you can actually frame the object the way you want it so this is showing how I have the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy framed and the uh, frame of reference of the plane wave. If I want to move it around, I can change how I want it to be positioned within this, the frame. Uh, I can also play with the rotation if I want a different rotation. Uh, I can even do mosaics if I wanted to do a, uh, let's say, a one by two mosaic for some reason. Uh, we could do a mosaic of a larger area. And then I just capture that view and load it into the sequence in Voyager. And the sequence editor in Voyager is really pretty straightforward. <clears throat> this is the sequence that I used for the Whirlpool Galaxy. There's a variety of tabs here across the middle where you set up the sequence, any constraints, uh, what to do on start. I have it pointing to the target and then focusing. Uh, cooling is set to minus 10. Uh, it will manage the rotator based on the, the rotator uh, position angle. So it looks at the position angle from that field of view, which you can also see right here is 96 degrees, and so it will rotate the camera to that 96 degrees. You can also tell it to do based on the sky position angle, in which case it will plate solve to find the right rotation angle tracking and plate solving usually don't have many changes. It's managing the meridian flip. It's guiding at three second exposures and dithering. Uh, it's going to focus using the actual filter, which there's no filter. Uh, even though it calls it the luminance, it has to call it something. And it will focus by slot and also every 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes it will go through a refocus, but you can control that by temperature, by time, by uh, degree, altitude, and so forth. And then on end, it basically just ends. It doesn't do anything special. So that sequence, uh, and I have it set for um, five frames, and then repeating those five frames five times. So 25 frames, uh, and I could set that for longer, because there's, but there's really not a whole lot of time I'm shooting on the target. <clears throat> Set this however you want it, and then I typically load that into a drag script, which will run during the night unattended, and do the imaging for me. So when I get up in the morning, all those files have been loaded from a Dropbox folder on the remote computer onto my home computer, and then I'm ready to go into PixInsight. So with that, let's go into PixInsight. So let me move this out of the way and let's open up PixInsight and typically what I will do first is go through process uh, image inspection and blink 
There we go. And what I'll do is load up a night at a time. In this case, I had several nights worth, but let's just load these. So I'll load these files into the blink process. And what I have found most effective, uh, it's somewhat tedious, but I actually will zoom in and go through the images one by one and look for any elongated stars or anything that doesn't look good. In fact, actually, I don't think I used any of these. But if I see something I don't like, then what I will do is click on the move to selected files to move to a different location and I will move them to a folder called rejects. So I'm basically just taking them out of the sequence. Once I've done that, then I'm ready to open the uh, WBPP, the <coughs> weighted batch preprocessing. And this is, as I understand it, I'm, I'm new to uh, PixInsight. I've only been using it for a couple months. Uh, I understand, or I believe, before WBPP was available, it was a pretty laborious process. And this really takes a lot of the work out of it once you kind of figure out how to set things up. So I've got my lights set up here, and I've got uh, 40 light frames that I wound up using. And under image integration, I have that set for Windsorized Sigma clipping to clip out satellites and uh, unwanted pixels. I have a set of flats, a set of darks, a set of bias frames, and then when I go to calibration, um, the camera I'm using, PixInsight's not able to automatically pick up the uh, color filter array settings, so I have to specifically tell it it's a, <coughs> these are CFA images, and select the uh, RGGB mosaic pattern. And sometimes I will pick a frame that I like in particular. Other times I'll just let it pick the frame it likes best. And then I usually set up a swap file that's uh, on my D drive where I do most of my uh, image processing. So once everything is set up here, I'm ready to, to press run. <clears throat> and when I do press run, it will go through and do all the calibration. You're probably all familiar with that. When it's done, uh, one other thing that I've done, I have found that it works best to separate the RGB channels. So it will actually output uh, a stack of 40 in the red channel, 40 green, and 40 blue, all as monochrome images. And then I'll combine those. It, <coughs> where that helps is it actually registers the reds, greens, and blues individually. So if you have some chromatic aberration where you're getting some fringing on the stars, this will help correct that. So normally I would press run and then go get a cup of coffee or do something else for a while while it runs, but I've already run it. So let's just exit. And the next thing I would do then is go load up my stacked red, green, and blue files. And those are going to be in in my swap files folder in the master folder in here are red green and blue so let's just open those and these will come in like I said as three monochrome files a red a green and a blue and sometimes I will take the trouble to um, to kind of normalize the these with a linear fit process I do most of my color work in Photoshop and so most of the time that doesn't seem to be necessary. So with that I will jump straight into channel combination. So let's just go to all processes, channel combination, and we will put the red in the red channel, the green in the green channel, and naturally the blue in the blue channel. They then click the red circle and that will tell it to apply that and it will create a new image <coughs> that is now an RGB color image of red, green, and blue. And we can do just a quick screen stretch on that to see what it looks like just to make sure everything appeared to go okay. It looks kind of red. That's okay. That'll get taken care of. Uh, 
On this image, I did a uh, dynamic background extraction uh, just by doing uh, using the process that uh, Sean can't think of his last name offhand uh, on uh, on YouTube. Uh, it will I will think of it, but. He, he showed this process of using kind of a relaxed dynamic background extraction. I know I've got some weird stuff going on at the top, so I would move these down into a, a more normal area. If I created a new one. And I'm sure the Pixinsight experts among you are probably cringing as you watch me do this. Um, Sean Nielsen. Not visible dark on YouTube. So we'll apply this. And it usually runs pretty quickly. So now that that's done, I'll close that. And let's do a quick stretch again just to see how it looks now. Typically, I would play with a couple of different stretching processes. Uh, the two I use the most are the screen transfer function, which we're looking at here, and the arc sign. And those are kind of two extremes. Uh, the arc sign, uh, inverse hyperbolic sign, actually arc sign H, uh, can be a pretty harsh stretch, and it also tries to preserve star color. And I found it works pretty well with this image. So what I'm going to do is turn off my screen stretch. And let's open up the uh, arc sign stretch and click the circle to open up a preview window so we can see what it's going to look like. And uh, usually we'll wind up cranking it almost all the way over to the right. <clears throat> and then an automatic black point. And typically then I would back off of that black point a little bit. And I don't like to go too far with this. Uh, you know, probably something about like that, and then apply it. I have found if I keep going with an arc sign H and try to improve on this, it usually doesn't get better. It just gets worse. So at this point, I would typically abandon the the inverse hyperbolic sign and go straight to a simple histogram transformation, and work with this a little bit, but we need to get a preview window. Continue brightening it up a little bit, pull the dark level down a little bit. And sometimes I will tinker with color, sometimes I won't, depending on how close it is or how obvious it is. In this case, I'll just leave it as it is. And let's go ahead and apply that. So now we have a what I would consider a well-stretched starting point. Uh, I'll do two other things at this point. So we can close this and close the preview window and here's where we're at now. The next thing I would do is apply noise exterminator. Uh, there is still some noise here and noise exterminator just does a wonderful job of cleaning up that noise with little if any effect on the uh, the galaxy or the stars. I mean, it just, uh, <clears throat> Russell Crowman, who developed this, has really just done a wonderful job putting this together. Uh, there is a control for the amount of noise to remove. I think I have that set at around 85 or 90 percent. And for the most part, I just don't mess with it. I just let it do it. It does its thing. It runs pretty quickly with the uh, graphics processor and I have been extremely happy with the results. Uh, I think the guideline is that you should try to do it as early in the process. Uh, I seem to like the results I get better doing it later in the process. So I don't know how well it translates across YouTube, but that's the after. So what I would do now is save this as a 16-bit TIFF file, and then the last thing I would do is run either Star Exterminator or Starnet V2. Generally I have found uh, with the more saturated stars that I get with the arc sign H stretch, uh, Starnet seems to do a little bit better job uh, than Star Exterminator with 
when I have a wide field image with smaller stars, uh, then the star exterminator is by far does a better job, and it also runs about twice as fast as StarNet. So once I create a starless version, then I would also save that as a 16-bit TIFF. And at that point, I'm done in PixInsight, and we'll go to Photoshop. And what I want to do in Photoshop is load the two files that I just created, and I'll do that using scripts, load files into stack, and you get this dialog box that you can then browse to find the files that you want to load. And these are still on my D drive in the uh, swap files. Oh, I take it back. <clears throat> these are saved back with my originals now. And what I'm going to load here for this is the ArcSign stretch with StarNet 2 and the arc sign stretch that still has the stars. We'll just use those two frames. Click OK and OK. And the nice thing about this script is that it will load both of those files as layers within Photoshop. So I'll have two layers. One is the, uh, the galaxy with stars and one is the galaxy uh, for the most part without stars. And this is a script that comes standard with Photoshop. So here's the, uh, the starless image. And you can see that it's still left uh, a few uh, stray stars. Uh, looks like there's a galaxy here. Uh, some fuzzy stars it didn't remove. Inside the, the galaxy is pretty clean, but for the most part it's the stuff outside. So I'm just going to grab the spot healing brush and go around and clean up some of these things that appear they should have been taken out but weren't. So this can be a pretty quick process. And you'll see there's a couple of faint satellite trails. I don't want to take those out because if I take those out, those are going to wind up being treated as stars, as you'll see in a minute. So I will take those out later. I'm not going to take them out right now. So, for this, for this purpose, that's good enough. Now I want to create just a, a plain star layer. And to do that, I will come back to the layer that is starless, and it's on top of the layer with the stars. So that's with the starless layer turned off. Turn it back on, you can see the starless layer. I can use the blending options to change the blending mode from normal, where it basically is just opaque and since on, on top, to subtract. And when we subtract everything but the stars from everything including the stars, the difference is the stars. Now, the nature of Photoshop, when you're looking at something through a blending mode, it's kind of temporary. If I change this back to normal, it goes back to normal. But what we want to do is capture this state. And to do that, I'm going to do a, a, a merge all visible. And the keyboard shortcut for that is Shift Control Alt E. And this is going to create a new layer that is the, the stars on a black field. So let's just label this stars. And in fact, I'm going to put this in a group and <coughs> label the group stars. And I'm going to change the blending mode on this whole group to add or linear dodge. And then we'll come back to the starless layer and put it back to normal. What we've done now, we subtracted the stars, put them on their own layer, and added them back in. So be between the two, it looks exactly as it did before. But if I turn off the layers below, we'll see that all we see is the stars. If I turn on, turn off the stars, all we see is the galaxy. And what that lets me do then is process the tone and the color of the galaxy and the stars separately. So for now, let's just turn off the stars. And this doesn't need a whole lot of work. I would typically just go to a levels adjustment layer, darken the background down, and probably add some contrast to bring out some of that gas around the 
the nebula, or the, I'm sorry, the galaxy. Now we want to take out these uh, trails. So I'll go back to the spot healing brush and to take out a, tra a satellite trail just click at one end, come down to the other end and shift click and it draws a line with that brush tool which in this case is the spot healing brush and it will take out that satellite trail. And we'll do the same thing with this one and I think there's a few more here and there that we would probably want to take out. So now we've got this background somewhat cleaned up. It's still a little noisy in models. Uh, let's do another trick. I'm going to pull the background down a little bit darker. And I'm going to add a solid color layer from this yin-yang looking symbol at the bottom of the layers palette. This will just create a new solid fill layer. And I'm going to choose a very dark gray somewhere around 25 or 30 in the RGB. And because the picker is over on the far left, it's just a pure dark gray. There's no color in it. Click OK. And again, this is in normal blending mode, so it just covers up everything. If I change this to lighten blending mode, you can see what it does. It has lightened anywhere that the background is darker, so that we have this nice, solid, dark background. But it lets things that are brighter show through. <clears throat> and we can play with the uh, levels now and adjust this for whatever level of extinction that we want. And if there's some areas that, like at the top here, uh, we know we want this background area to basically be just black, other than where there's a, a galaxy or something showing. So we'll just add another back blank layer. I'm just going to grab the brush tool. Paint with black is my foreground color. Use the bracket key to make the brush a little bigger. <clears throat> and we can paint with 100% opacity. And let me turn this solid color layer off that just by painting like that it looks like we're just making kind of a mess out of the background but remember we have this solid fill layer in lighten blending mode so all of this noisy stuff in the background as soon as I turn this lighten blending mode on it all just evens out nicely and we have a nice clean smooth background Typically it's going to be a little bit too smooth, uh, so what you would probably want to do is rasterize the layer once you're good with the way you have it set, and then go to Filter, Noise, Add Noise, and usually somewhere around 5, 7, 8 percent, something like that, is a, a pretty good point that will blend with the rest of the image so that it doesn't look unnaturally smooth and it all just kind of blends together. To get a little bit of sharpening and contrast, I'm going to make a duplicate copy of this layer, the starless layer, bring it up above everything except our, our solid color layer that is making the solid background. And I want to use the high pass filter, which we can use to accentuate dark and light edges and it will give you this kind of a medium gray looking feel but as you move the slider to a higher and higher pixel value it'll start to bring out more of that structure and it's basically creating dark and light halos around edges and you can play with that to find something that seems to look pretty good uh, focusing primarily on the the galaxy itself I'll do something around 43 pixels, click OK. And I know that looks terrible, but when we put this in soft light blending mode, now it's adding that detail. It's a, a form of sharpening to the galaxy itself. And in fact, if we want to make it even stronger, we can switch from soft light to overlay, and that gives an even more dramatic effect. We really only want that to apply to the core of the galaxy itself. So I'm going to add a layer mask 
and since it came in as white I want to invert the layer mask so I'll click on the layer mask control I to invert it now we have a black layer mask that's hiding everything I'll grab the brush tool and paint with white at 100% opacity and flow and just paint that in right there so the last thing I may want to do is play with saturation and color I might want to boost the saturation a little bit and we might want to play with the color balance a little bit uh, I really like doing this in Photoshop because you're doing it visually rather than numerically and when we get all done we can turn the stars back on and generally I find the stars will be a little bit too bold so I will throw a levels adjustment layer on top of the stars and one of the reasons for putting those stars in a group is what happens in the group stays in the group so if I have a levels adjustment that's affecting the stars it's only going to affect the stars so by changing the black point I will kind of clamp down and make the stars smaller we can adjust the brightness of the stars then if we want to and you know keep a, a lookout for dark rings and uh, artifacts one of the things I don't like about that process is a lot of times you start to lose some of the the nice diffraction spikes around brighter stars if I turn that mask off you can see that actually there's more more around there so what I'm going to do is grab my brush tool again tap X to make black my foreground color make the brush just a little bit bigger than the uh, the star and the diffraction spikes and just paint black on the mask for that levels adjustment and what that'll do is bring back that those diffraction spikes and keep those big stars looking a little bit more natural something like that so we have happy stars and the last thing I might do if the stars still look a little bit big is go back to the stars layer and just run a uh, filter other minimum and a couple pixels two three something like that just to uh, squeeze these down that basically what the minimum function does is it expands black into white or dark into light uh, that's the opposite of the maximum function which would expand light into dark so it's not a dramatic effect but it just kind of uh, tightened up those stars a little bit so that's the basics of how I processed this image. Uh, captured it at the remote observatory with the uh, plane wave, CDK 12.5. Ran it overnight uh, using Dropbox to, to synchronize the, to a folder on my laptop here at home. Processed in PixInsight by picking out the best of the frames. Uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. You want to remove bad frames because they don't do you any favors uh, all they do all a bad frame can do is make everything worse uh, and then process in PixInsight to create color uh, by combining the three channels red green and blue a uh, little noise reduction uh, a little dynamic background extraction uh, I do my main stretch and then save things out ready for Photoshop and I would probably wind up doing more sharpening and uh, the last thing I would do is save this just as it is with all the layers intact and then use Lightroom to do any final uh, color, tone, uh, sharpening, presence for things like um, uh, vibrance or uh, texture and clarity. And that was the end result when I got all done. I hope you found this useful. Uh, I went through it pretty fast. If you have any questions, uh, be sure to drop them in the comments. If you found this useful, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel because I do post uh, content like this somewhat regularly. And I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under a clear dark sky. Thanks.